Welcome to another show of Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlis and I am your host. The focus of this program is to show the amazing lives people have lived and are living. The key word here is live. Everyone has a story to tell. All stories are worth telling and celebrating. Over the years I've read too many obituaries that left me pondering why did I, I, why did I not have a chance to meet this person while they were alive. Well, the goal of this program is to celebrate the lives of everyday Vermonters who are all very much alive and well. If you would like to be interviewed or know someone that would like to be interviewed for this program, please contact me at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com. Now I'd like to introduce my special guest today, John Montrose. Welcome, John. Thank you, Gary. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Thank Good. you for having me here. I appreciate it. Absolutely. This. So um, let's celebrate your life. Okay. Where would you like to begin? <laughs> well, I guess most people say, well, I was born on, you yes. know, or in. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was born in uh, January 29, 1949, in Poughkeepsie, New York. And... Um, to Leonard and Marion Montross. Dad was 20 and Mom was 18. Mm. Um, they had actually eloped. No kidding. Much against their parents. <laughs> <laughs> they actually, the two of them contrived. Dad was in the Navy down in Maryland and uh, Mom got her parents and his parents to drive down to Washington, D.C. for the cherry blossoms. Mm. And then, you know, the parents were playing cards and they said they stick around. So dad said, you know, can I borrow the car? And they said, sure. So they ran off to a justice of the peace. Wow. Uh, wow. So, you know, needless to say, the parents were really excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I was the son of a, you know, a young couple. Mm. I mean, you know, dad's 20, mom 18. Yeah. Um, Mom's parents lived with us the whole time that I was you know, that we lived in Poughkeepsie. Mm -hmm. They had a bedroom on the second floor. Mom's mother was, had been a, um, a housekeeper and cook for a doctor in Brooklyn when she came over from Germany in mm. 1918 or something. Mm. Uh, Mom's father was from Poland and he came over with his father and a brother back around 1918 or so, I believe. And then, um, he actually joined the cavalry, and he was a cavalry sergeant. Wow. And we have pictures of him on his white horse called Lightning. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty interesting to see those pictures. My father's father was a steel worker, and we have a picture of him walking up the cable on a suspended bridge, which is now the Bear Mountain Bridge. No And kidding. this is before the days of safety nets, safety belts, and everything else, and he's just walking up the cable to the top of the exactly. tower. Exactly. Yike. Um, Jeez. So, you know, that was, was, that, was that family. They, both families were in Montpinter's Falls, and they met in high school. Dad graduated a couple of years ahead of Mom. Hmm. And uh, so, you know, it was, it was somewhat contentious for Dad having his in-laws in the house all the time. I can imagine. Um, but, you know, I mean, they were very supportive, and Mom and Dad could go out and do things and go places, and we had built-in babysitters. Yeah. You know, exactly. Um, my grandmother, being strict German, believed that um, children should be seen and not heard. Mm. So for a lot of my life, I didn't say a whole lot of things that I didn't talk and I wasn't really outgoing to people. Um, mm. But, you know, that, that's you, changed. You had that gift of grandparents being really close to you. Yes. Um, which today, it, it's a little different, I think. Yeah, yeah, it is. It really is. Dad's parents both died when he was young, when I was young. Mm. So I didn't really get to know them because we, you know, we didn't. We visited them fairly frequently, but I just wouldn't know them right. you know, that well, right. as right. well as as the ones living with us all the time. Yeah. Um, my grandfather then started working for IBM. He was a tool and die maker, and he and Dad actually built a huge, beautiful train set. A Lionel train, you know, scale oh, Lionel yeah. in the basement, and it was a monster, and it had all the 
turns and sidings and wow. this is and that's and everything else. Wow. Which was pretty cool. It was neat to do. Do you have a picture of that? I don't think I do. That Maybe, would be a great picture to I know. I, 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 I will look. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there are some archives, but I will look. Um, so, you know, I went to elementary school. Um, the elementary school I went to and the high school that I started at were both built uh, by FDR back hmm. in, you know, the uh, what Works Project Administration, is yeah, that what it was right. for building? Right. Beautiful buildings. Wow. Um, so, you know, I went to that one, that one school, just like a mile from my house. Um, and, you know, I made lots of friends. And then when I got into high school, I started getting into the choir. Mm. And in the high school choir, I was in the boys quartet and uh, sang in a number of different, you know, there's area all states and there's there's mm. all counties choirs and then there's all state, all state. Mm. So I was in one of those also. And you know, it's done by adjudication and competition and the, the uh, nomination of your choir director. Wow, so you had a gift. I, I enjoyed singing, yeah. And yeah. Then when I went to college, I continued. I sang. And I, you know, I went to Hamilton College, and that was a men's college at the time, so mm -hmm. it was a men's choir. Mm -hmm. So I sang in that, and we went to Europe in 1968 with a, wow. a girls' choir, choir from Oneonta. Hmm. And um, so, like, four or five weeks of traveling around in buses. Wow. And singing in all these little towns here and there. And in Europe, all through All Europe. around Europe, yeah. Oh my Spain, goodness. Italy, and Switzerland, and oh Germany. Oh, goodness. Um, what a wonderful thing. Belgium. Yeah, we had a lot of fun with that. I wanted to, before we get too far into your um, college years and stuff, what would you say is the greatest gift that your mom and dad gave you? Um, I would say love. Mm-hmm. Support. Mm-hmm. You know, they were, uh, they were young and, you know, in spite of her parents being there and being somewhat domineering, I mean, they were, they were very loving and mm. caring. Mm. And we did a lot of traveling. Mm. Um, and you, you're swinging back to that, and that's good. I, <laughs> I'm kind of going off on a tangent okay. in a different way. Um, we did, we drove across country easily tw twice, if not three times. Wow. Uh, in an old 98, I was in the back seat while we're driving down this big car um, all the way across country, New Mexico, wow. Arizona, California, Nevada, um, you know, the bit, the uh, big redwoods, Up in Yellowstone, yeah. Yosemite, yeah. Um, and all of the, the Carlsbad Caverns and things like that. That's really, wonderful. Really great stuff. Wow. And then every other year, Dad wanted to go see college football in Florida, so we would hmm. drive down around Christmas time. We would actually have Christmas on the road. Hmm. We had this little Christmas tree that we took with us, <laughs> um, and we would drive down to Florida to my to the Miami area where the Orange Bowl is. They had a parade the night before New Year's Eve, oh. and it was a, like a light parade. And they had big sections of the street that were lit up so you could see the bands and stuff, but the floats were all lit up. Mm. So we'd go to the parade and then go go back to the hotel and get up in the morning, and then we'd go to the Orange Bowl and watch college football. No kidding. Yeah. So we did that, I don't know, five or six times wow. think, driving down. And that's before there were interstates. Right. You know, so we are going down Route, route 1. When mm. we went out west, we were on Route 66. My goodness. So... Uh, you know, that, there's a lot of memories when you hear the songs about Route 66 and that exactly. stuff. Exactly. It's really cool. Wow. Uh, okay. So. And let me, one more question about that, those young years. Um, when you were a little boy, did you have any uh, dreams about what you wanted to do when you grew up? Everybody wants to be a fireman, but I was like, eh, you know. Um, I got to the point where I really wanted to be a teacher. Mm-hmm. And then when I got into high school, um, I really enjoyed biology and genetics. Mm -hmm. So I figured, you know, I would go into like being a biology teacher. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then, you know, when I got into college, I was a biology major until I got to cat anatomy, and that kind of <laughs> pulled the plug out of them. <laughs> okay. uh, so, you know, I started to be a religion major. Uh, I did not finish at Hamilton, but I did finish years later at Syracuse mm. with uh, a bachelor degree in business admin mm. from the Whitman School in Syracuse. Mm. While I was young, going back to being young, yeah. um, scouting, I was very active in scouting. My dad was very active in scouting. He was very supportive of, of that because mm. he had been an e he had been a scout. He was an Eagle Scout. An Eagle Scout. Wow. So he saw a lot of value in that. Yep. So he's very supportive, and Mom was also very supportive. Mm. So you know, I went through Cub Scouts, and they were involved with that. And then I got into Boy Scouts, and I went you know through the ranks to, to become an Eagle Scout and, and scouting. Um, I did some of the the, the boy leadership roles. Yep. Um, I became an, a member of the Order of the Arrow, which is kind of like an honor society for mm. scouts. Mm. And I went, there were three stages in that, and I eventually was, you know, received the vigil honor, which is the, the top honor you can get with that. That's amazing. And then, and then the Order of the Arrow was in an organization called a Lodge, and I was actually Lodge Chief or President for a couple years wow. when I was in high school. Wow. Um, and then you know, I was at camp staff when I was a young teenager, like 13 and, uh, and whatnot. Mm. So I worked in different areas of that. And then I worked in a dining hall one year. And we did a lot of singing that year in a dining hall. <laughs> <laughs> and then another year I was actually program director of the camp. The, the whole scout experience, what a foundation for um, I being self-assured or confident about life and uh, well and also being considerate of other people mm. you know I mean you're not only your relationship not only your self building but you know yeah. how you work with other people and how you should be with other people mm. it's it's you know it's very interesting that way mm. very helpful mm. um, so then after I was out of college for a while I was living with my parents in Cairo, New York, and they, uh, the local people asked me to become Scoutmaster. Hmm. So in like 73 or 4, 73 I think, I became Scoutmaster at Troop 43 in Cairo, New York. And uh, had a really great time with those boys. They loved it. No. You know, I was single so I didn't have, you know, and I was living at home so I had a lot of extra time. So we did a lot of extra things. Yep. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah, we worked at getting um, some funds and stuff from local organizations and from from um, fundraisers to get, um, I think it was eight, eight boys, to go to the National Jamboree in 1976. I was going to go as one of the leaders, and I was not able to get the time that I, that I needed to go to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and as I was telling you, that in 76, because of the bicentennial, we decided that we wanted to do something a little bit special. And there's, there's a series of flags, the Don't Tread on Me, and Pine Tree, and the Betsy Ross flag, and a whole bunch of others that I can't remember their names, really. So we ended up having about a dozen flags with carriers. Their money was donated by local businesses and organizations. So we actually ended up being like an honor guard in several parades during the bicentennial with the troop carrying those flags That's at the front of the parade. Fantastic. Going out, which wow. was really cool. Yeah, I bet. Really I neat. Bet. Had a lot of fun with the boys. Mm. Uh, and I, I received the District Award of Merit like in 77, I think it was. And then in 78, when I'm, well, I met Barry in 76 at a wedding on Cape Cod. Barry being my wife oh, that's um, of 46 years now. Wow, congratulations, Jan. And um, so in 78 was when we got married, so I had to retire from scouting because I was going to move and, and that sort of thing. Mm. So, you know, that was kind of a, a, a sad point in my life when, you know, you're leaving. Something you've done for yeah, so many, yeah, yeah, for so long, you've been so much a part of, and it just, 
Yeah. And you know, and we knew we we thought hopefully you know once we had children if they were interested we would help them go through scouting too. Mm -hmm. And our two boys were born Matt in 1980 and Ben in '83, and they both were Cub Scouts. They went through Cub Scouts, but they were not interested in Boy Scouts. They were more interested in baseball. Okay. Well. So. And they became really good athletes, and they became good at what they did for baseball. So, you know, when you support Not surprising. You know, you just support them, that's all. Exactly. That's what you do. Exactly. Um, now, uh, you had mentioned, I think, in reading your bio, that uh, Barry also is a singer. Yes, she is. She and I were both members of different choirs for a while. Um, <clears throat> I joined the Mendelssohn Club at Kingston, when we left in 2014, I had been a member for 30 years. Wow. Um, and she was a member of the Bard Symphonic Chorus. Hmm. Bard College is a part of Red Hook. We had moved to Red Hook in 1989 from uh, Saugerties, New York. Um, and ben, ben and Matt actually went through their whole, all their school years in Red Hook. And it was, it was a highly rated school district in New York at the mm. time. So we <coughs> wanted to do that. Mm. And we were in a really nice neighborhood, much like ours. Mm -hmm. You know, there are about 30 houses. And um, so we got to know a lot of the neighbors and we did a lot of cool things, you know, like block parties and everything else in the neighborhood. Right. So that was fun. We had fun with that. Oh, that's great. Um, so the boys graduated, Matt, in uh, 98, I believe. And then Ben in 2002, and Matt had graduated from UVM in 2002, so we had a joint graduation party in the backyard. Mm. And mom being the penultimate cake maker and strawberry shortcake maker, <laughs> um, Matthew wanted a strawberry shortcake, so mom's signature was a cake about that big around with a tier with cream and uh, sliced strawberries in the middle and then another tier with whipped cream and whole strawberries on the top. Wow. And then she also did sheet cakes and that were fully decorated like they come out of any of the bakeries around here with oh the roses goodness. and everything on. Oh my God. Really gorgeous cakes. Wow. Um, so that was, that was our block party that year. Wow. Yeah, that, that was fun. Oh, uh, where do I want to go from there? Let me see. So yeah, so you changed, you changed your major in college. You, I did. You did more business administration. Yes, when I was, I started working at IBM in 1974. But, <coughs> Poughkeepsie was the, the kind of the hub. Poughkeepsie hub. was yeah for a long time, uh, even though I lived in Saugerties, um, Poughkeepsie was the office, so I went there, and I was basically the typewriter repair guy. Hmm. Uh, I carried a 27-pound tool bag around and went to offices. My oh territory my. was Kingston and Saugerties, but my office was in Poughkeepsie. Wow! So, typewriter repair guy. That's a, yeah. They well, must have had hundreds, if not thousands, of typewriters oh, in those days, right? Absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> all over the place. My gosh, um, you know. So and people paid for maintenance agreements on them. So whenever they broke, you know, wow. they'd call IBM and IBM and. I was a part of a huge group of guys. Wow. And uh, we would be dispatched from a little radio or a beeper or whatever. And uh, you'd go into the office. That's, you know, the selector typewriters with the, the round, the silver ball. Yeah. And even the older typewriters with the type bar, the, the oh bars that hit the paper. Gosh, right. Yeah. So it was, you could fix both of those things. And they're totally mechanical then. Jeez. Nothing electronic. The only wow. electric was the motor that drove everything. Wow. So uh, you had to be a really good mechanic to, yeah. to do that kind I of bet. thing. You know, uh, good diagnostic skills. And that job is totally gone. It's gone, gone. It's yes. It's in a museum somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that 27-pound tool bag you had. That's in my basement. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> there are still some tools that come out once in a while. Um, yeah. No, that was that was fun. And then I moved from in the field after 13 years to working in the office and supporting the guys in the field. Mm. And then I actually got promoted out to, excuse me one second here. I got promoted to an organization in Poughkeepsie called Service Delivery, which 
this, the organization in Poughkeepsie was service delivery and service planning for computers. Mm. So that was a huge step for me going from mm. something that sat on your desk to something that was in the back room right. driving your, your terminal. Right, right. Um, wow. I didn't have to fix those, but what I, I was in the parts area responsible for that. So my, my job was to make sure when a new product came out that we had all of the part numbers available to the guys in the field and that we had source of supply through the plants to, to feed that need. Mm. Um, hmm. And then as time went on, I actually became a representative for Mechanicsburg, which was the main parts center for the U.S. Wow. I became representative at Kingston and Poughkeepsie plants, hmm. and then later on even Endicott for a little while wow. um, to make sure that parts were available to everybody. And then as time went on, I... Um, I got into what was called the Realization Network or organization. And that's the group that when you take like the hard drive out of your laptop, they would be sent back. You would get a new one put in. Right. Or whatever, you know, by the repair guys. Right. Uh, the old one would go back and we, the Realization Group would set up vendors that would take those parts in, scan them, read them, erase them, and then in a lot of cases what they could do is if there was a bad section on a hard drive or something, they could make the machine block that. Hmm. So it never tried to write in that one sector. Oh my goodness. So instead of, and that they get them back out to the field. So like for $20, give or take, you could get an equivalent to new hard drive to put back into somebody's machine instead of having to pay $400 for, for that. Brand new. So for a number of years, we were saving IBM approximately $90 million in parts. Wow. By using the, the realization wow. parts. Wow. Um, That's amazing. Yeah, so I, I was the site rep for a while, and then I went into the realization organization, and I was doing all sorts of staff work there. And then in time, I actually... Um, the, the, the engi I became part of the engineering group that did that, that worked with the vendors that did the repairs. And then that group was expanded to be a global group. Mm. So we had guys in China, India, Japan, Hungary, England, uh, Amsterdam, Holland, Glasgow, Scotland, or uh, Grinach, Scotland, Scotland, all around the U.S., Australia. Um, so I sort of became like an operations manager for the, my engineering manager. So I did all the nuts and bolts of how the, the organization worked mm -hmm. and ran while he did all the technical stuff. Okay. So I was basically like an operations manager wow. for him for, for a number of years. International. Yeah. No. Yeah. Did, so did you, you know you get to travel at all? Amsterdam and Scotland. Okay. Um, Made friends in a few places, but uh, in fact, I made a friend. We made friends with a guy in Australia, and Matthew, for his junior year abroad, went to Sydney, Australia. Hmm. So I had my friend there. I told him that Matt was coming, and he actually met Matt at the airport and took him to the college. Oh and my stuff. goodness! So that was that was really nice That's having, you know, you like you've got a contact point there. Exactly. Yeah. You know, if there was anything, any problem with our end or his end, right. there was a way to get more information through. Wow. That, w that was a lot of fun. Um, so, you know, I retired in 2012. Um, and then in 2014, both boys were, around 2012 or so, both boys were living in Waterbury, like a half a mile apart. Mm. Um, and it was four or five hours for us to get to them from Red Hook or them to get to us. Right. So they were like really saying, you know, why don't you move to, to Vermont? <laughs> you know, you've retired, do something. Mm-hmm. So we, we, you know, from so from 2012 to 2014, we were looking, you know, and then we finally settled on the place where we are, you know, um, Stanford Farms Road. Yep. And, uh, so we, you know, we bought the property and had the house built there. That's beautiful. That worked out well. And you're the 
head of the HOA for the I am the president, of the, yes. You know, in 2019, when the last house was built, the developer um, and builder handed the, the whole pro HOA process over to the people. And I said I would, you know, be the president. So that's been five years. Yeah. I've been yeah. doing that. So what, John, what's harder, uh, running the Boy Scouts troop or managing an HOA? <laughs> that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, well, you know, you're dealing with adults, which is fine, but you're dealing with adult personalities, which is not always fine. <laughs> right. um, but it's fun with scouts. You know, I, I would still like to be involved with scouts mm. somewhat, but I mean, I'm involved with Masons up to my ears, so, um, you know, yep. I do that now. Yep. Um, and yeah. What was it like? You went through your whole career in one company, yep. and you moved through it in different capacities. 37 and a half years, did, yeah. Did you, that's 37 and a half years. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah I dodged a lot of layoff bullets. Boy, good for you. There were a number. But was, obviously, by staying, you're saying basically the company treated you well. Was they that, did. Yeah. Yeah, in time. You know, if you worked hard and you, you did, you know, what you had to do, then everything was okay. But, I mean, there were, there were times when people were still very surprised. I mean, they were called into the man's office and your job isn't here anymore. Yike. You know? Wow. Um, because they were just doing head cuts. Wow. You know, to save money. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was a tough thing to see. You know, you didn't want to, you know, I had a, a number of friends that just left. Yeah, um, right. And you, that, That's hard. That is very hard. And, and what, you know, what they were doing was, okay, so George left, so now whatever George was doing has to be picked up by everybody that's left. Right. So then you start dividing up what George did, so, you know, it's spread out across yeah. a couple other guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow. So, you know, that was... Yeah. Did, uh, did you carry on your parents' tradition of traveling with the kid? With ki Do you have brothers and sisters? Or I'm it. You're it, okay. I'm, I'm the only, you, only child. Did you carry on their tradition of traveling with the we, two boys? Uh, we did some. We did, we did some trips down to Florida a lot, you know, the Disney and Universal, those yep. guys. Yep. Um, we didn't do it much driving, and, you know, as, as airplane... Mm. You know, fares got better and more planes and stuff. Was, we did some traveling with that. When we, when Matthew was in Australia, um, Barry and I and Mom went to Australia to visit him, wow. and then we came back with him. And on the way back, we went to New Zealand, so wow. we drove around New Zealand, <laughs> and then we flew back to Hawaii. Jeez! And we had actually Benjamin come as a surprise to Hawaii. Fantastic. And meet us all in Hawaii. So oh, we stayed wow. at a, at a timeshare that we had in Hawaii at the time. Wow! So that was a lot of fun. Yeah. And then we all flew back together. That's fantastic. Um, and then you know I w I was in business business to Greenock and Amsterdam. Barry went with me a couple times to those. And then Barry and I have done trips. Uh, for our 25th wedding anniversary, we went to Scotland, drove around Scotland. Mm. Uh, about 1,100 miles we drove around Scotland. Wow. <laughs> um, seeing all of the sites. At the time, we had a friend that we met through a bagpiping situation, which is another piece of our life. Um, he was a fellow of Scottish antiquities, so he said, okay, these are the places you have to see where not a lot of people go. Hmm. So he had a list. So we were, wow. you know, up in the Isle of Skye and over here and over there and Inverness and stuff. Wow. Um, so we, we did that for a 25th wedding anniversary. And then we've been to, uh, let's see, we actually went to Scotland another time. And then we did a tour of uh, Tuscany. Hmm. Mm -hmm. where we actually stayed in one town, Monte Cantini, and did, you know, day trips to Pisa and Siena and Florence mm -hmm. and Cinque Terre and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then, uh, let's see, what else? Well, then that same year, that was in May, and then in, in October we actually did a, our friends from uh, Arizona said, hey, you know, we want you to, uh, to join us on a cruise, a Mediterranean cruise. So we started in Barcelona and went through the Riviera and down along the west coast of Italy to Sicily and then around the Horn of Italy and up through Montenegro wow. and Croatia wow. and uh, um, Slova Slovenia. Yeah. And we ended in Venice. Wow. Wonderful trip. And the people that we met that I mentioned, we met, we actually met them on a trip to China. When we were building our house in 2014, we had already arranged to go to China. So we went three weeks to China. Wow. And we made some friends that um, we still see and we still, you know, connect with the, the couple in Arizona and the couple in San Diego. That's fantastic. So we have some fun when we do that. And Barry and I go to Arizona once a year, usually for two, three weeks. That's wonderful. Have some fun, fun with that. Talk about bagpipes. Bagpipes. <laughs> Um, when Benjamin was 13, we had gotten a flyer that was on the table of, you know, learn the Highland bagpipe. And he picked that up and he expressed an interest because when we had been down to Florida, we went to Epcot and the Canadian section of Epcot, there was a two-man combo. One guy played bagpipes and another played the drums, and they said they had been thrown out of every respectable bagpipe band in Canada. <laughs> but they were doing modern things. You know, the guy was playing MC Hammer on bagpipes. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> which was a trip. I bet. Um, <clears throat> so Ben said, you know, I want to do that. And... For years, we had seen this one band when we lived in Saugerties and, and elsewhere, and we had become friendly with the, the woman that was in charge of the band through a food co-op when we lived in Saugerties. So she was giving lessons. She's the one doing the lessons. So we took, Barry took Ben to the lessons the one night, and he was there with two other grown-ups. And then when she went to pick him up, Janet, the instructor, said, He's a natural. She said she just played him a tune on, the, on a practice chanter, and he played it back to her, not having been able to read music or mm. anything. Mm. So he was able to play back by ear. Yep. So he really started to enjoy that. And uh, he has gone through competition, you know, from being an amateur, and now he's considered what's open, which is like professional. Wow. But in the meantime, you know, well, he was... She wanted, Janet wanted Ben to start coming to the band practice so that he could go out with the band and, you know, and be in the pipeline. So I took him one night and I was sitting there on the sidelines watching, you know, the band rehearse. And the, the drum sergeant came over to me and said, we've got a problem. And I said, okay. And he said, well, our bass drummer's been grounded because of grades. <laughs> so he said, could you play the bass drum? And I said, I've never played a drum in my life. <laughs> and he said, yeah, well, well, you know, it's, it's a bass drum, so it's like boom, boom. That's all you got to do, basically. I said, okay. So I put on the harness and I strapped, you know, put the drum yeah. on the harness yeah. and we were marching and then we went outside and I, you know, I kept the beat and we just kept it going. And then I did some instructions so, you know, you embellish the beat different ways kind mm. of thing, you know. I never got to where I could troll the sticks like some of the guys Oh, can. yes, right. The snare um, drum players. Can well, the snare, well, the tenor Oh, and, drummers, the, and, the, and the bass, yeah? yeah? The, I've seen bass drummers do it, but, but tenor drummers. Barry then joined like a couple months later along with a husband and wife team of another young guy that had joined the band about the same time as Ben. Wow. So we had three new tenor drummers, and they're the ones that do the real fancy trolling oh, okay. yeah, on yeah. like a field drum that's not a snare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh. So they were on that. So from March through September, many, many weekends, we would be traveling to go do parades, you know, fire parades, town parades, St. Patrick's parades. Wow. We did the, we did, um, St. Patrick's Day in New York City. We would really Marist College would rent a bus and and pay for us to drop the ride down, and we we played, we marched the alumni association for Marist College. That so we would go down, you know, to New York City in March, sometimes warm, sometimes chilly, sometimes snowing. 
Mm. Um, there were times. <laughs> I mean, you know, the the snow was building up on the on the snare drums and the tenor drums at wow. one time. And then there one time it was so windy. If you're marching up Fifth Avenue, you know, you've got cross streets, and it's like all of a sudden you hit a cross street, and the breeze caught oh. you. And I was going sideways in the <laughs> with the <laughs> big drum. You know, I've got this big sail in exactly. front of me. Exactly. <laughs> so I did that, and then uh, eventually I actually ended up out front. You know, the peacock out front with the big hat and the, wow. the cake, you know the big um, plate and all that. Yeah. So I was a drum major for a few years. Wow. And so, and your son was playing bagpipes. My son and your was playing bagpipes. Yeah, Barry we had the was, three of us were in the band. Isn't yeah. that amazing? We, we did, you know, what a nice New York City. We did um, um, the parade, and we were in a part. Then we joined another bagpipe band, and we were in. Uh, we did Boston, the Boston parade. That's like a four mile parade. Wow. You know, so you're in wow. South End, and you go all the way out down the commercial streets and then you take a turn and the guy said, well, we're at the halfway point. I'm like, oh, please, <laughs> you know. So then we're, then you're going down through the neighborhoods and that's where everybody's right. really happy right. and they're hanging off the, the balconies and the, the porches and they're coming out and giving you a beer while you're driving, you know. Oh I mean. my goodness. So, it's, you know, it's that, that closeness, but the people are just so wild. Yeah, yeah. You know, it just kind of like puffs you up, so you just keep yeah. on going. You know, that's <laughs> well, a lot of fun. That's great. It's great fun. <laughs> um, so that was that. And then let's see, the one thing we've missed out on so far is uh, in 2000, I became a Mason. Yeah. Joined the uh, Bread Hook Lodge um, of Masons. And I went through all of the officers' chairs, and that I became the lodge. The master lodge president mm. in 2010, and then uh, in 2012, I was commissioned to be what they call the district deputy grand master, which is like a, a state position, and, uh, and they were all most of the most of the counties were districts. Mm. Um, so my district was Dutchess County, which is 800 square miles. I had 10 lodges that I was responsible for. Mm. And it was my job to oversee the proper function of the lodges and report their ability to be function as a Masonic Lodge mm. to, you know, to, to the higher ups, to the Grand Master. Mm. And there are times whenever I went to a lodge in my district, I was the Grand Master personified kind right. of thing. Right. So, wow. uh, you know, it's like you're, uh, when you're worshipful master, you're, you're worshipful master. And when you're in the district deputy thing, you're the right worshipful, you know, so, right. um, you know, titles. Yeah, wow, you know. leadership too. Yes, you know, so, so it shows your, your levels. Exactly. Kind of. um, and then when I moved here in 2014, I had already become a member of um, York Rite, which is another side organization to basic masonry. And then there's Scottish Rite, which is another side organization. So I had joined both of those organizations in Poughkeepsie. Mm. And I came up here and I got very involved. And there were three pieces of York Rite and I've been a, an officer and a lead officer in all three of those mm. sections. And in Scottish mm. Rite, I've, um, I've been a leader in that also. Mm. Um, and in June, I was, um, along with four other gentlemen in, in the state, given a, um, it's called Meritorious Service Award by the wow. Scottish Rite for my service to, to Masonic community. Wow. John, what's the mission of being a Mason? What's the... At, in, in short terms, it's just to make good men better. Mm -hmm. It's to, to help men understand their belief in God, their, their interest in the country, family life, being a, a good family person, um, believing in charity and relief, mm -hmm. um, supporting other people, being friendly. Um, supportive of each other you know it's nice to go to a place where the men are nice and they aren't necessarily you at a bar which you know has its place in life but right. i mean some bars it's just 
there's so much rowdiness and whatnot that right. you, you don't always feel a part of that. Yep, yep. In, in, in the Masonic Lodge, religion is not discussed. Politics are not discussed. Um, and it's that simple, you know. Yeah. You, you can be there, you can be your own person. Doctors, lawyers, farmers, whatever, you're all at the same level mm. in the organization. Mm. So it's like, so there's no, no pretense. Yep. Yep. You no, know, you're just, it's just John and Gary. Yep. You know, yep. whatever Gary does for his life, whatever John does for his life, you get there, it's John and Gary. Yep. And it's a supportive, so if you were having a difficult time, you could, the Masons would be there if, for if you. If you have to, the Masons yeah. can help you out yeah. financially. Yeah. Help they have. We've done a few men that way. Yeah. We've helped out. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. But it, it's, you know, and it's, there's an education pieces. I mean, there, there are these little esoteric things within Masonry that are just, you know, what are some of the meanings of some of the symbols and what do they mean and why do they say that and, mm -hmm. and where does that bring you, you know? The Blue Lodge, the Basic Masonry Lodge, is, is non-sectarian. So, I mean, and the, the lodge is opened and the Bible or a book of scripture is open on the, on the altar. We have Jewish brothers and Catholic and Protestant brothers. So we have the Holy Bible and we have the, the Jewish book. Yeah. I've been to ceremonies where we've initiated and we've had the Koran. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, and other, whatever the spiritual book is for the person that Let's, they worship, that'll be on the altar, okay. open. That's it's a non denominational, so to Non denominational. Speak. And wonderful. you don't talk nominations when you're in a church. Yep. You, know, you believe in one God and the existence of, you know, and the immortality of the soul. Those are the two things you talk about in religion. Mm. That's it. Mm. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So that's a big chunk of your life as well. That is an amazing chunk of my life. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because there, you know, there are other organizations that you become you are invited to become a member of. So there are three of those that I'm a member of the two. Okay. <laughs> so I, and I'm an officer in two of the three. You have there's something that people see in you around your leadership. I guess. Yeah, what do you think that is? What? I don't know. I I, <laughs> I don't be bashful. Well I I try to see honesty and truth in all people. I don't go, I don't uh, profile, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I let people be themselves and I give them the, I don't, you know, typecast when I meet somebody. Mm -hmm. I wait until they present themselves to me so that I can mm -hmm. understand who they are and what they are and what they do. And then if that doesn't fit in my scope, then I, move on, that yeah. fits my yeah. scope, then, then I'll work with them, I'll yeah. be part of them, yeah. you know. Um, and you know, masonry, masonry kind of supports that, mm -hmm. um, you know, to try to be, to be really a nice person. Mm. You know, you, you worry about God, you worry about your family, and you take care of yourself. Mm. A simple structure in life, but so powerful. Just Very. let people be who they are and without judging them one way or another and let them present yep. themselves. That's, it's, sometimes the simplest things are the most powerful things. They, they are, you know? they really are. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, yeah. and you know, and a lot of the guys like me because I'm honest and I, I'm friendly in the lodge and I just, you know, I befriend everybody in the lodge. Mm. And, uh, you know, I'm supportive in any way I can, sometimes with my truck. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there are a number of guys I've helped move. <laughs> uh, are, are there things we haven't touched on yet that you'd I like don't to think so? Yeah. I think we you know, we've talked about bagpiping and, and singing and masonry and scouting, um, family life, you know. Yeah. Barry and I have been married forty six years and we're That's proud. Oh, church. Church, yeah. church, 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 church. Um, when we moved here, when, well, when we were in, in Red Hook, I was one of the lay readers and one of the lay ministers. And when we moved to Burlington, we were like walk, 
going to churches to look at them. The first church we went to was the Cathedral Church of St. Paul down on, on between Cherry and Pearl on Battery. Yeah. And uh, we felt very welcome there. Mm -hmm. And basically, it, you know, when we went home that day, Barry said, I don't think we have to look anymore. So, it's okay. Uh, there you go. Um, so in time, you know, we, 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 uh, I got into the lay ministry doing readings, the readings for the services and, and helping serve on the altar. Um, Barry became very involved with the, the hospitality part of, you know, the coffee hours after service, special meals and stuff. Mm. Um, and then I'm kind of a fix-it kind of guy. That's, that part of me never died. <laughs> um, so, you know, I started doing fix-it things around the cathedral. So then all of a sudden I am now a member of the Buildings and Grounds Committee. And uh, I enjoy doing that because there are things yeah. they'll say, hey, you know, can you look at this? And I'll look at that. And I go, that's kind of above my pay grade. <laughs> you know, so they go, okay, you know. Um, but there are things that I will delve into and do. That's great. That I, that I enjoy. A very transferable skill. Yeah, and I've since become a trustee for the cathedral. Oh, wow. And Barry is on the vestry, which is the other, you know, yep. administrative group in the, in the cathedral. Yeah. Do you sing at the cathedral? No, I don't. I, I, no, I know. I, I, I can't read music that well. Hmm. So, you know, we do, but we have belonged to the South Burlington Community Chorus together. We did that for mm -hmm. a few years. And then COVID hit and, you know, and it's just, we've gotten so involved with other stuff that we don't have the time necessarily to put yeah. to, the, to the choir, going back to the choir. But I can't read music that well. So, you know, every week you've got different services and, you, and then, you know, four part music kind of thing mm -hmm. for anthems and things. And I, yeah. You know, just to pick that up on Thursday night at a rehearsal and to be able to perform it on Sunday, right. I I don't feel comfortable. Yeah, you know, when I was when I was in church in Poughkeepsie, going to church, mom was the superintendent of the Sunday school, and you know, like two or three hundred kids that she was responsible for wow. providing education to. Wow. Um, there were, you know, they had a great choir, but there was one guy that sang bass and like. He'd be booming along when he knew the part, but then if he didn't know the part, you hear <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> if I boom, I boom the whole thing, <laughs> right. or I don't boom at all. <laughs> you know, so just I, I just couldn't do yeah. that. So you know, I because uh, it, it's frustrating to me that I can't put out there the harmony yeah. kind of thing that I like to sing. So okay. Any awards that you've gotten over the years? You mentioned some things um, in the past, but are there um, any that stand out that you want to talk about? Well, the MSA was, you know, the most recent one. Um, the uh, Award of Merit when I was a Scoutmaster. Mm -hmm. um, I did receive, when I was District Deputy Grandmaster, I had done a lot of work with D. Malay, which is the boys organization mm. in, in Masonry. And I received the Legion of Honor, the Honorary Legion of Honor from them. Oh, that's wonderful. So oh. that, yeah, that, was, that, was, that yeah. was a neat thing. Yes. That was fun. Um, I, I don't know. You may, I probably have it down on my mind as a blank at this point, but if you got something no, that okay. tip no, me no, on, just, I don't know. Just, uh, how about, we're about ready to end, but before we go, I, is there a, a life philosophy or a quote that has guided your life that you'd like to share with the audience? Um, <clears throat> well, the one thing is, you know, like, don't judge a book by its cover. Mm. And then the other one was, uh, I've got it written down here, so I'll read oh, it good. for you, all right? Um, the minister, when I f we first went to the cathedral, would always end the service with this quote, and then she would get into the blessing. But it's, life is short. We do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk this way with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome.